Welcome back. This is Future Vision, the 2020 DTG Summit, streaming live from London. Now, as we all know, technology is forever improving the television experience with more lifelike pictures and improved audio quality. Now, artificial intelligence is being applied to content discovery using voice as a friction-free form of interaction and search. Our next panel considers advances in each of these areas and asks what consumers actually want. Well, here to set the scene and to chair the discussion is the leading media technology analyst, Dr. William Cooper. William. Thanks, Andrea. Well, welcome to this session on advances in sound, vision and control at Future Vision, the DTG Summit. I'm William Cooper and I run Inform ITV, a consultancy specialising in television and video strategy and technology. We help organisations around the world manage the challenges and maximise the opportunities of new and emerging media technologies. For over 15 years, I've been advising on innovations in television and video. Before that, I was responsible for online and interactive operations at the BBC. Many of you may know my weekly online newsletter, Connected Vision. Uh, if not, I encourage you to sign up. It, it's free at informitv.com. Well, with me today, I have a panel of experts in their respective fields to talk about advances in audio and video and the viewer experience in general. Maria Aguete leads a team of analysts tracking the evolution of global service providers and operators. Formerly part of Screen Digest, then IHS Market, and now Omdia, she's known to many of us for the market research and data that they produce and is here today to represent the consumer perspective. In, in other words, what are the current capabilities and expectations of viewers? Jamie Hindoff is Chief Operating Officer at BT Sport. After working at the BBC on its London 2012 Olympics coverage, he joined BT Sport, which established its broadcast centre in the former media building at Olympic Park in East London. From there, and it, it really is a fantastic facility, BT launched the first 4K ultra high definition sports channel in Europe. And they continue to innovate with Dolby Atmos sound and trials of 8K UHD. Dr. Mariana Lopez is an academic researcher and le lecturer in the field of sound production and post-production at the University of York. Her particular interest is in how advanced sound technologies can be used to improve the accessibility of audiovisual productions for those with visual impairments. Stuart Savage is Director of Innovation for Digital TV Research and Development in Europe for LG Electronics. Over his career, he's worked at the BBC and Sky and for the last 20 years in the consumer electronics sector. He now focuses on all aspects of digital product and platform development and is an active participant in many European and international forums. Patrick Burden is an expert on how conversational voice interfaces and metadata can be used to improve the overall viewing experience in relation to search and discovery. He previously worked at the BBC, then Red Bee Media, which became Ericsson, now uh, joining TiVo, which merged with Xperi last year. So that's our panel. When we talk about improving the uh, technical experience, the quality of television, we can consider three areas. There's audio, the sound quality, but as we'll see, also how we interact with services. There's video, the picture quality, arguably the most evident aspect, and control, perhaps less obvious, which concerns how we can adjust and customize these characteristics, but also how we decide what we want to watch. So in terms of audio, it can become a more immersive and interactive experience. Rather than considering two or more channels of sound, we can consider the virtual location of individual sources of sound and potentially mix them differently according to our listening environment. And traditionally, we think of television sound as being broadcast to an audience, but it can become a more interactive and even conversational experience. If you think about how you can use your voice control to navigate choices of viewing, for instance. Secondly, in terms of video, there are actually many different dimensions to consider. There's the temporal dimension, uh, moving away from interlaced images will be a start and increasing the frame rate. Then there's the spatial dimension that we tend to consider when we think of image resolution in pixel width and height. And then there's how much information each of those pixels carries. And people increasingly talk about high dynamic range, but we also need to think about things like sampling precision and other aspects of the quality of each of those pixels. 
And then uh, finally, there's the element of control. It's a fine thing. Which is about customizing aspects of how people um, can interact with these different uh, uh, characteristics. Also, how they can search for and discover relevant programming and make the whole experience more interactive. And in all of these, there are at least three parties that contribute to the experience that can actually be delivered. There are the viewers themselves with their expectations and the investment that they make in hardware products and in their viewing time. There are the consumer electronics manufacturers who want to sell them products and sometimes services and to differentiate them with attractive features and functions. Then there are the broadcasters and service providers who need to provide programming that takes advantage of these innovative features. And there's a tension between them. Sometimes the manufacturers seem to be ahead of the consumers, driving supply ahead of demand. And sometimes consumers have expectations or capabilities that are ahead of what the market can deliver. And broadcasters and service providers need a, a critical mass of consumers with certain capabilities to justify investing in innovation. But I think what's changed is that it's becoming comparatively easier for online service providers to innovate compared to traditional broadcasters who have to continue to support legacy standards for many years. So what is the long-term strategy for improving the technical quality of broadcast television, given the rapid development of these online services? Or is the technical quality of broadcast television good enough already? Well, um, let's ask the audience uh, if we can. Um, do you think the current technical quality of vision is good enough? Uh, do uh, let us know your thoughts screen now. Do you think that uh, broadcast television particularly uh, is good enough? I'm thinking of national broadcast here, the broadcasters here and those that comprise the majority of broadcast television viewing. So broadcast standard used to be the gold standard, but it's now all but lost that meaning. Um, Think about resolution in every dimension. What about the overall viewing experience? Is high definition the new standard? And should we be planning to switch off standard definition? Is there sufficient benefit in 4K UHD over HD for the average viewer? Or should broadcasters be embracing 4K for delivery now or in the future? Are other features more beneficial or cost effective? We've got high dynamic range, higher frame rates. So is the technical quality of what can be delivered online good enough? possibly better than broadcast. So we've had a fair number of submissions now. Um, so let's see if we can see the results. And interestingly, uh, we've got a split opinion. So uh, something to debate, uh, which is great. So um, more of you think that it's not good enough, but uh, a surprising number of people think that it is. So. Let's turn to our first speaker to give us a bit of uh, perspective on the current consumer uptake of new technology and to give us a feel for how much consumer appetite there is for some of these features and functions. Maria. Thank you very much, William. Let me go to my deck. So yes, I'm going to show you all uh, some of the figures based on our consumer survey about how consumers feel about the uptake of new uh, technology like voice activated devices, about the role of smart TVs, and how important is uh, 4K, or even if it's something important to them when they buy a new TV. According to our consumer survey, there, is an, there was at the end of 2019 an average of five devices per home. But we expected at Omnia that in the next five years, the growth will come from smart TVs in the living room. A smart TV growth will vastly outpace media streamers. Why is that? Well, in the past, media streamers were growing really high because there was not a lot of smart TVs installed in the market. Uh, due to the lack of smart TV install base or even poor implementations of a smart TV operating system, uh, there was a big growth in those DMAs. Although that growth will, con they will we still expect growth coming from DMAs, more of that growth will now come from smart TVs. Also, we see very positive growth in games consoles and, of course, in smart speakers, VR headsets, or smartphones. Smart speakers is a very interesting one. 
although yes, there is a big, big growth in the next five years uh, in the smart speakers uh, device, we did a survey asking consumers if, uh, if they were concerned about uh, the security of having a voice activated device at home about a smart speaker. And uh, according to our results, 19% of women said they would not have a smart speaker at home because they would be concerned about the security issues. So female more worries than male about having smart speakers at home. We, we also ask, what about voice to control video? Is this something interesting to you? So the right question, the exact question was, in the last three months, did you use voice to search for content? And as you can see in this chart, only 5% of Americans said that in the last three months, they use voice to search for content. So it looks like most of the voice activity devices is for other things, like set up a time, alarm, ask questions, is not really still broadly used to search for content. As I said in this chart, only 5% of Americans said they use it in the last five, in the last three months. But also interesting to know that if we go into more detail about uh, people that they have a Apple HomePod or if they have Alexa, uh, if they have Apple HomePod, Amazon Echo or Galaxy Home, the numbers are higher. So those that they have an Apple uh, HomePod, 24% said they use voice. So that is also a very interesting thing to take into account. Of course, the difference of usage varies a lot country by country. We have here, again, here the question is, have you used in the last year a voice to search for content? And we can see countries like, countries like India, 40% said yes. Again, this is an online survey, so probably those in India who uh, answer the survey, they are those with uh, most sophisticated or the latest devices. But it's interesting to compare in Japan, only 5% versus maybe Brazil, 17% of people saying, yes, they use voice uh, at some point for, use, for search for content. Regarding age group, also probably it's not a surprise to see how there is a very big difference between uh, those between 18 to 34, like those between 25 and 34 years old, 32%, yes, they use voice to search for that content, while uh, if we go around, to that group above 55, 55 to 64, only 6% feel comfortable using voice to search for content. So I think a lot of work still needs to be done here to make it a mass market. Also what our service shows that once you use it, people like it. It's positive impact, helps you find the content and those that they use voice feel very satisfied with the experience. Why this is important? There are so many services available currently. Finding the right content is critical. If voice can help you finding that content, you will have a happy client, churn will go down, everyone will be happy. Again, one of the high reasons for churn is not is just if, of course, the price is too high, but also not finding the right content is a reason for people to leave. Other important thing in voice activated devices. Consumers crave interoperability. What does this mean? If you have a device that can speak to other devices in the home, that's what consumers want. Hence, why devices like Amazon Alexa has so much positive feedback, because consumers feel they can use it to activate other devices in the home. TV set still remains the main place for people to watch uh, content at home, especially during the pandemic as well. People like to watch content in the big screen. And this is important when we speak about voice activated, uh, voice integration. Why? Because at the moment, only 50% of smart TVs are, can they have a voice assistant compared to 80% of media streamers. So currently today, only 50% of smart TVs have that capability versus 80% of media streamers. Here you have, again, I will not go into detail, but most of the TVs sold at the moment are smart TVs. 81% of sets sold now, they are, sets SIP are now smart TVs. Fantastic data from my colleague Paul Gray in the consumer electronics team. And here again, who are the big markets when we look at Android TV? India, the US, Brazil, Indonesia. 
I will be happy to send you this deck, so don't worry too much if you cannot now pick up on all the metrics. Finally, how important is 4K? It is important, so when people go to buy TVs, of course, they want to have a large screen, they want a smart TV, but yes, uh, 4K is important, although uh, for those that they have content, it's more important for, than for those who, who don't. And at the moment, there is not so much content available. Uh, we keep tracking titles available in 4K, we keep tracking channels available in 4K, and again, the growth is slow. There is, of course, more content year on year, but that growth is slow. And just to finalize this presentation, how can we make money from smart TV platforms? What are the benefits of having a smart TV? How we can all make the most of this platform that now seems to be in most people's houses? We will discuss more in the panel, but if anyone wants a copy of this deck, I will be happy to send you a copy. Maria Rugaguete at omdia.com, happy to help you with these metrics and more information about consumer behavior. Thanks, Thanks, Maria. Maria. Um, and we'll come back to um, the voice control aspect in particular. Um, if we can come to you briefly, Jamie, and BT Sports been leading the field in many respects with pioneering new delivery technologies to differentiate your coverage. How important is 4K or potentially 8K to the coverage of sporting events? And what other quality factors should we be considering? Thanks, William. Yeah, it's, I mean, live sport, it's, it's about accuracy and, and our mission, we're only eight years old at BT Sport, but when we launched was to take people to the heart of sport. So it's to give people that real life experience if you're not at the event. So I, I always think you should turn it around the other way and think about the form of capture, because if you capture something in 4K, the quality in HD is also improved. So we've always aspired to, um, to capture in the best quality possible. And as you said earlier, we launched uh, Europe's, so I think we're on the world's first live 4K channels back in in 2015. But one of the things that um, that people have missed in that slightly is about the mechanism of delivery. So we deliver it over IP. Um, and when people talk about broadcasters and OTT, they all get very confused. We're one in the same thing. We curate content and we broadcast it, but we're using different pipes to um, broadcast it over. Um, so picture quality, absolutely critical for me. Best best quality capture delivers that, but why stop there? So we launched Dolby Atmos and uh, again, the first to do it. And for sport in particular, you want to, I know it's not there at the moment, but you you want to re recreate that atmosphere of the stadium in someone's home. But it's also that little known fact that your viewing experience is enhanced by 60% by sound. And I do feel sound was a forgotten medium in TV for a very long time. So we were really pleased to bring that in. Um, we now also have HDR as standard alongside 4K, wider color gamut as well. And, you know, WGC is really important because if you want someone to feel like they're at the event, you want the colors that they see at the event to be the same as what you're broadcasting. And then we know in standard television, the color spectrum is very narrow. So therefore, you're not recreating that environment. And as you alluded to earlier, we have done a couple of events now in 8K. Um, but the biggest significant change for us was 2019, where we put all this together in a strategy and we launched a channel called BT Sport Ultima. Uh, but what that is, is one channel made up of different component parts. And it ties into your bit at the, the start about needing a mass market because you don't. So, so what we do is we capture in the best quality available and then dependent on your connectivity, dependent on the platform you're on and depending on your subscription, that live event, event will be served to you in either 4K HD, 4K HDR, 4K SDR. And, and basically the channel looks at the device you're on and that criteria and serves up that best picture quality, which for sport, uh, I think is really, really critical. Um, and then where are we going from, from all of this now? I mean, I agree with you about higher frame rates. Um, we're looking at that at the moment. But also delivering over IP, it's about being able to look at object-based broadcasting, which, of course, is what Dolby Atmos is, actually. Uh, and it's looking at breaking down your video into packages to give people choice around quality. And, and for me, I wrap all of that up in personalization, which I think is critical uh, for the way audiences are moving forward. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, staying on sound, actually, Mariana, we've heard that sound's an important element of sports coverage, but there are other ways in which sound can be important to viewers. Can you tell us a little about your research and some of its applications? Yes, of course. Thank you, uh, everyone, for having me. And thanks to DTG. Hope you're all uh, doing well. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about 
the uh, Enhancing Audio Description Project, which was a project I work with um, Gavin Kearney and Christian Hofstadter from the University of York and Anglo Ruskin University. And it was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And the project was all about accessibility to film and television for uh, people, audiences with sight loss. And as I'm sure you um, are all already aware of, uh, currently uh, and traditionally, we offer accessibility to audiences with sight loss through something called audio description, also referred to as AD. And this is a third uh, person verbal commentary that basically explains what's in the visual layer of a film or a TV production. And this is something that is added after a film or TV production has been completed. So it's not integral to the creative or technical workflows. And filmmakers, TV producers have no involvement in that uh, accessibility layer. The Enhancing Audio Description Project sits uh, within an, a remit that is slightly different, and it's one of integrated access. And by integrated access, I mean um, products that are created to be accessible from the start. So we integrate accessibility from the development stage up to delivery. And this follows what we call universal design tenets that tells us that if we incorporate accessibility from the start of a product, it's cheaper to add, but it's also uh, of a better quality. So this has to do with pushing quality into accessibility provision. In addition to integrating accessibility to um, the workflows of film and television, we are also eager to reduce the over-reliance on verbal explanations and instead explore the creative potential of sound to create accessible and engaging experiences. And experiences that are accessible and engaging for people with sight loss, but also for people that are sighted. And we do this through what we call the EAD me methods. And these are three methods that I'm going to go through uh, very quickly with you today. One of them is the use of sound effects to tell audiences things that are key to the story. And this is not new to film and television. We use sound effects to let audiences know loads of things about a film or TV program. So sound effects can tell us where something is taking place, when it's taking place, is it day daytime, is it nighttime, uh, what actions are being performed, and maybe how many characters are in a scene as well. By making them more prominent in a mix, we can help that uh, function as an accessibility layer. And you can turn, you can use them to turn scenes that would be completely inaccessible into accessible. So if you think of a montage sequence that is over-reliant on music and visuals, if we add sound effects, we can start uh, transmitting all that information to audiences with sight loss. We also work with binaural audio. And binaural audio in very, very, very simple terms is the rendition of 3D audio through headphones so that we can localize uh, elements, sound elements in space. And when uh, we're working with true binaural audio, what we get is a sense of externalization, as if the sources weren't in our headphones, but in the real world. And why is this important to accessibility? Well, by positioning sounds accurately in space, we can then tell audiences where characters are, where they are going to, so we can pan the dialogue according to the position. And we can also indicate what sounding objects are in a, in a scene, but also where they are. And this again helps reduce verbal descriptions and make the accessible version of, um, of a piece more engaging. In our methods, we don't record binaurally uh, because that would involve changing the way audio production workflows uh, operate, and that wouldn't particularly be, be very useful, but we actually post-process it in the post-production um, uh, stage. In addition to these two methods, we do recognize that there are cer certain elements that are difficult to convey through sound effects and spatialization. So things like colors that may be relevant to the story, gestures, uh, facial expressions, etc., might be a bit challenging. So we use a first-person narration. So instead of having a third, person narrator, we have a first person uh, integrated to the accessibility layer to explain those aspects that aren't conveyed through sound effects or spatialization. And in this way, uh, we have very sparse verbal descriptions. The combination of these three methods is what we call EAD methods. And the really important thing is, again, that they are integrated to creative and technical workflows and creative teams and accessibility experts can work together. Now, this really is, is really interesting when we talk about personalization. Sometimes 
we hear concerns about we losing the creative intent of the team. But actually, I would argue that by integrating accessibility to workflows, we're giving creative control to the filmmakers, television producers, because at the minute now, they, there is no control on the accessibility layer. But if we integrate it to workflows, there is a co cooperation that is actually happening there. So it's very interesting to think about it in that way as well. It's also interesting- Thank you very much, Mariana. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Stuart, from a consumer electronics uh, manufacturer perspective, we've heard a lot about um, sound. What, what other characteristics are really relevant to consumers in terms of enhancing technical quality? Uh, th thank you, William. Thank you, everybody. Um, at the outset of lockdown, um, forecasters predicted it was going to be a very tough year for manufacturers. Uh, and possibly as a result of Premier League project restart, uh, it's probably been a substitute for the for the no Olympics and no Euros effect. Um, and we've seen very strong sales. Uh, consumers uh, really want to recreate stadium type viewing that they're missing at the highest possible quality in their home. Um, and to, in order to do this, they're looking for the premium quality. Now, uh, in the next five minutes, do a very quick whistle stop tour of some of these aspects that deliver this. Um, and for us, top of the tree, uh, and for many people, it's OLED. Uh, it's still the only self-emissive technology that's widely available uh, at the consumer level. Uh, micro LEDs have been demonstrated, um, but volumes, volumes of those are still in the, the hundreds. Uh, and if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. Uh, it may be one for a future year summit. Uh, and other self-emissive technologies have been promised, um, but still appear to be even further away from practical consumer viability at the moment. Uh, next level down, uh, it's still all LCD LED, um, but basically because they are all backlit technologies, they can never ultimately uh, be perfect. Um, picture quality is, is not just a matter of resolution and several, uh, many uh, complementary technologies are applied to deliver the best quality possible. And I'll very briefly cherry pick a few of these, but there are many of those in the next few minutes, obviously leaning towards um, those um, that LG favour. Obviously, um, self-lit is um, self-emissive. It, it, its clear advantage is, for example, in the backlit uh, over the backlit panels, is their ability to perform at the dark end of the spectrum, uh, and we can produce, you know, deepest blacks with no, no bleeding uh, across the screen, and they enable the highest possible content uh, in, in dimly lit scenes, which is a, a, a big trait uh, of many um, thick, um, film films that we see. Um, in an LCD TV, the, there's, uh, it's constructed of many layers, uh, many, many more layers than an OLED TV, and each layer is there to serve a purpose. Uh, however, what can happen at a higher layer is that it can reduce the effects of a lower layer, uh, and it's a balancing act to trading one picture quality aspect off against in, and another. But obviously also remember uh, that um, to a greater or lesser extent, each layer reduces the, the amount of light that ultimately, that ultimately reaches the front of the screen, and so to maintain the brightness, the backlight has to get brighter. Now, obviously, this is really achievable. We can do that. But the cost is uh, power consumption. Uh, and eco design is also a very critical aspect uh, of modern television design. It's also a case if you get what you pay for. Uh, an edge lit LED backlight is naturally going to be a much cheaper thing to implement than a full array of dimmable LEDs. Um, and the LED density of a full dimming array is obviously going to be a trade-off between cost and picture col contrast quality. Uh, and don't assume that because a manufacturer has implemented a dense array of um, uh, backlit LEDs one year means that they'll be there in subsequent years. It all comes down to cost and benefit and, and a marketing mix. Um, you may have noticed in previous slides the term nanocell. Um, well, this is what nanocell gives you. It's all about creating the purest colors possible at the highest resolution. Uh, color quality is very much related to producing the best red, green, and blue primary colors. Uh, and nanocell particles contribute to this by filtering out other unwanted impure colors uh, from the spectrum generated by the backlights in LCD LEDs. And because nanocells particles are applied with, directly within one of the layers of that um, LCD TV, uh, um, they work at the subpixel level. And compared to other equivalent technologies that also enhance colors, uh, they don't result in bleeding from one uh, pixel to another. 
And when you combine the above with, with the well-established in-plane switching technologies, you get the purest colours at the widest viewing angles. And it's an extremely important factor for typical home viewing conditions. It's not much use having a, a picture-perfect 8K uh, if the only person who can appreciate that is the person who's sitting in the 15-degree arc uh, of the front of the screen. And all the purpose of the previous mentioned technologies is to bring LCD, LED screens up as close as possible uh, to, to, to the picture quality that can be achieved by OLEDs. Uh, but, um, you know, according, according to generally accepted wisdom uh, and industry expertise, that gap can never be completely closed. Um, so coming on to imaging processing techniques, which is very much currently state of the art and it's currently very much a work in progress. And these can be applied to both self-emissive and backlit panel technologies. Uh, and generally, they're only applied at the high end of manufacturer's ranges. The current trend is to lump all these approaches into the banner of AI processing. But whether or not these are really AI, uh, I'll leave you to judge that. But year on year, we're making major improvements uh, and increasing the number of uh, different features that we implement. Uh, and a lot of this is now coming towards dynamic intelligence rather than static algorithm applications. Automatic brightness control is one of the first of these features to be implemented. You can argue that it's not really intelligent, but it's all lumped in this, into this category. And what it does, it appreciably improves picture tones and brightness levels according to the ambient light levels of the room. It also provides a contribution to an energy saving and eco issues. Face enhancement picture processing is certainly a, an AI feature. Uh, and whilst it might not be, uh, or, or the gains might not be uh, huge for uh, high-end budgets, high drama, well-resourced, well-funded um, uh, well, well projects, for the vast majority or a huge amount of uh, content that appears on TV screens, uh, this can make a huge improvement. We can also improve text, that's text that's burnt into the pictures. Um, again, through in intelligence. This is not the picture play. This is not graphics playing uh, text in, 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 the, in the picture. It's improving the, the, the readability of text that's burnt into the, the backgrounds. Automatic uh, genre identification is also a major work in progress. Uh, the average consumer simply leaves his TV in, in a single set, setting that best meets his average needs. Uh, but what we're now working on as an industry is making that more dynamic from, from, from type to type. Whether, whether you believe this is beneficial or not is obviously sub subjective matter. Uh, and obviously the phrase director's intent, it will be a well-worn uh, phrase in, in the ongoing debate. But we expect that over time, uh, AI picture processing will deliver significant improvements, especially when you know what the limitations of the underlying core codec technologies are. Here's a well-known example. Anyone who's ever watched golf in the last 20 years will have seen this effect, whereby the golf ball switch splits in two as it moves across the screen. I trust no one claims this is artistic intent, but AI is now capable of making a very good job at masking that effect. And if you never watched golf, you get the same effect on football as well. Can't forget audio. Um, manufacturers and consumers are well aware of the limitations of sound productions from thinning panel displays. Uh, and number three, the most important issue for consumers behind picture quality and screen size is audio quality. Soundbars have made a huge leap forwards to enable consumers to receive um, uh, good quality audio, and it's no longer the just preserve of the techno bloke. A more recent introduction has been Bluetooth audio connection. Uh, and as illustrated on this, on this diagram, uh, a recent introduction has been Weezer, wireless speakers and audio, which promised to enable true plug and play uh, without AV amps uh, and play the wireless and surround sound object audio all together in a seamless plug and play manner. AI processing is also being applied to audio and while the industry is taking its time getting around providing object-based sounds and transmissions, the AI is already working as best as it can to, on, on dialogue enhancement and voice clarity. Moving on to the control aspect, um, I just want to make one quick reference to a piece of research that was done last uh, year by a fellow um, panelist. Uh, and it's, this, uh, it's obvious that it, well, what it says, 84% of respondents are interested in the ability to view, browse and search all available content from every available source, from broadcast to subscription in a unified single experience or interface. 
we believe that the TV is the best place to do that. Uh, and this goes against what some platforms uh, and individual uh, content providers want to provide to the consumer. Finally, we can't forget eco. Um, I did a whole half an hour on this last year, uh, but it still remains true today. And as things currently stand, it's a distinct possibility that 8K TVs will become un unsellable in, in the UK uh, and in Europe after 2023 if current eco directives remain as rigid as they currently are. The choice for manufacturers would either be to pull out of the 8K market or forego many of the above picture quality improvement techniques that I've discussed, plus many others that I haven't had time to do today, in order to get 8K TV down below the legal limit, which is the red line on this chart here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stuart. Well, we heard there about uh, integrated uh, search and discovery across all of the available content. Patrick, if I can turn to you, uh, what evidence do you have at Xperia that people actually want to talk to their televisions? Yeah, hi, William, thanks. I'll, um, I'll, I'll be brief, I know we're up against time, but I, I think, you know, if we talk about the, the importance of discovery, it's great having the best video, it's great having the best audio, but if people can't find what they want to watch, then they will turn off. And, and I think what we're seeing, and apologies, Maria, I'm gonna disagree with some of your stats here, but what we see in our users is, and the, the same report that Stuart referenced, we, we see in the US, around 39% of people have access to voice in the entertainment world at the moment. And actually about 22, 30%, or 20, sorry, 22% are using it on a regular basis. Now, what then happens is once they start using it, the average queries so that, you know, how popular it is goes up to something like 36. So it's not just it's growing in terms of the population, but actually the usage is growing. And, you know, why, why is that important to people on this call or to the video world? I think what we see in our analysis is that people who use voice actually churn far less from the services that they use than people who do not use voice. Um, the average depends on which country you're in, which, which region, 9, 10, 12% is a good average. We've seen sub 1% churn with customers who use voice. So it has a very direct impact on uh, how people interact with the solution. But also things like they watch more content. So people who use voice watch more content. They spend more money. So if they're in an interface where they can transactionally, you know, buy a VOD, buy a movie, spend goes up on average about 18 percent so it, again it, it's really important that people can find the content that they want that that they need and then they can access it quickly and i think voice you know as an industry we've done a great job of make, making uis very complicated but for me i think and for 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 tivo and for xperia voice flattens that ui and it gets people to content much faster than any other medium and i think that's the key and, you know, in terms of usage around the world, there's a billion uh, devices in home at the moment using voice. And if you look at the demographics of the people using it, it is younger people. Kids, voice is huge amongst kids. They're very used to it through YouTube. They're very used to it through other platforms. And they're only going to get older and that use is only going to grow. So I think, William, really, as we go on, it's going to become table stakes for any, any service provider will need to have a voice solution. And what does that mean for manufacturers, Stuart? Is, is voice something that's high on the agenda with LG? So, so voice is something that obviously we have been we, we working on for a number of years. Um, we've very much focused on our microphone being switched on by pressing the button. Uh, and that is primarily to address some of the uh, privacy concerns that were alluded to earlier. We are working on um, integrating it into the TVs themselves, but that uh, is still at the, uh, the small scale. Um, but I think that one of the big things is that if you're going to do voice on a TV, people believe or think that they're talking to the TV. They're not talking to an individual application. Uh, and what we're seeing is some of the early pressure from content providers is that we have to implement their voice engine for their application. Uh, and that is not something that consumers are going to be able to get their head around. If they want to talk to the TV, it talks to the whole of the TV experience, not just an individual provider. Jamie, what, what's your perspective uh, from, a, from a BT point of view? 
um, in terms of voices about of interaction and search and discovery, particularly. Perhaps not so important for, for sport, arguably. People, people know what they want and where they're going to get it. But for, for BT as a, a service provider, is this something that's uh, relevant to you? Yes, I think, I think um, yes. I mean, it's people want choice of how they find things and people want to find things. And I think single search and having technology, I mean, my, it's interesting what, um, what Patrick was saying, because my young kids, all of them are under 12, uh, use voice all the time to search. Um, whereas I still find it being 50 odd, slightly awkward. Um, but I do think there is a, an age demographic, and I think the generations coming through are adapting much quicker. And it's the norm, isn't it? It's the norm to talk to your TV for that age group, whereas for me, almost not having a wire from the remote control is still a novelty. But Maria, um, in yeah. terms of the stats that you presented, yes. what do you think is the biggest sort of barrier to people using voice? Is it is it about trust? Is it the the complexity? Too many potential providers of voice interfaces? Does it change by demographic? What 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 could be improved? Yes. So there was a chart before that shows exactly that. First of all, yes, it changed a lot by demographic. So the usage of those below, I have here the numbers below thirty four. It's double than those above, not more than double than those above 45. So people above 55 years old, only 6.4% wants to use voice to search for content. While other generations, those below 24, the percentage is 28%. So maybe because they're not used to, they're not familiar with search using voice. So there can be many reasons why they don't feel comfortable using voice. In terms of having voice assistance in general, uh, again, I quickly mention it. Uh, some people, especially females, 19% compared to 16 in male, said we do not own a smart speaker due to privacy, privacy issues. So this is regarding smart speakers, not, not necessarily voice to search for content. But yes, there is a still concern uh, at home. Many people are worried about who is listening and what are people doing with that data they gather, the conversations they're listening in people's homes. So that, again, is another topic that we need to address, security and uh, data privacy, what are companies doing with that information? Okay. It varies also so country by country, asked, William. Thank you. So we've been asked a question, um, to what extent is, is technical quality, does that triumph over the aspect of control, if you like? So the, the interaction, the ability for uh, people to personalize their experience and so on. So I think as an industry, we've talked a lot about some of the sort of measurable quality aspects because largely it's sort of engineering driven. So if we can measure it, we can improve it. And so we look at more pixels, better pixels, brighter pixels, whatever. Um, but we've been talking actually about how we can more generally improve the user experience. And, and many of the frustrations that people find are, are finding and deciding what to what what to watch and, and how to interact with that, whether that's through a, a remote control or, or their voice. Which do you think of, of those things? I'll put that to the panel generally. Anyone can uh, can chip in. Um, do you think is, is more important? Have we got to a point where we're, we've now reached a point of perfection in terms of technical quality and we now need to improve other aspects of the experience? Jamie. Um, can I jump in? Yeah, um, Please. I, don't think, I don't think you need to compromise on either. Um, I think as a broadcaster, you, you will always capture in the best quality possible. Uh, and as I was talking about earlier with how we distribute, from a format perspective, you give people choice depending on what their devices are. And I think it, it's, the, it's the joys of IP delivery that are now enabling that personalization aspect. And uh, so I don't see it as being one or the other. I don't think we've reached um, the top yet of um, video capture and delivery. Uh, I think there's more to go around depth uh, and higher frame rates, but I don't see that. We, we see the personalization very much as an aspect of improving quality and giving people that overall experience. Any, anyone else want to contribute on that? I, I think well, I would like to point to, to, to what's um, just about to start happening in Italy, whereby um, uh, that they've just made a significant move towards adopting DVBI, uh, and the reason that they've done that is to clear a lot of their DTT channels away from uh, their, their current multiplexes, with a view to uh, 
broadcasting um, UHD on terrestrial. Now that, for me, is what we should be doing in the UK. Um, we should be providing better quality to consumers over our DTT platform uh, and investing in it. Uh, at the moment, we don't seem to be doing that. So um, provocatively, can, can I ask, you know, should we be uh, just letting the towers rust and, and waiting to move to IP or is there another round to go in terms of, of upgrades? So we've heard about some countries that are, that are moving to 4K. There doesn't seem to be a great deal of appetite from, um, from the broadcasters. Uh, Jamie's in the fortunate position that he can deliver that to some people over a wire. Yeah. Um, so uh, is that something that we should be looking at in terms of our technology strategy in, in the UK? Um, and if so, how do we how do we drive that? I mean, I mean, personally, from my side, and this is a personal opinion, is IP all the way, uh, because it's not it's it's also about the fact that over DT you're broadcasting one to many, and IP allows one to one. So it's got it's got additional benefits, and um, I think that's um, the way it will go. I hope it's the way it will go, and I think the bigger explosion of things like 4k 8k etc will come when that happens that's a personal we've opinion. got to remember though that there is still a large uh, number of homes that are not connected or are inadequately connected to to the internet or even if they are they don't have devices that connect their televisions to the internet um obviously some demographic aspects to that some geographic aspects uh, as well um, for those that um, have to broadcast with a, a universal service obligation, um, that's that's a challenge, isn't it, to having a, a purely IP uh, strategy. Um, so do we do we need to invest in uh, that experience that is still, you know, the majority experience for most people in terms of, of television? And, you know, in my view, will be for, for some time to come. Um, and do, do we need to have more focus on the quality aspect of that? How important do we think uh, that that is? Um, because a lot of the debate seems to be about the, you know, the onrush of, of, of online. And online has the advantage that it can move in a more agile way because it doesn't have to carry this, um, this legacy and, and support it for, for many years to come. Um, is it incumbent upon broadcasters to invest in their own future? Or, or are they really just waiting to see if they can all go IP? Stuart, do you have an opinion on that? Maybe a personal opinion. Um, I, I think they're both going to be complementary, but I think we're a long way from the, the utopia of everybody having a fibre into their into their home. Yes, if everyone had a fibre into their home, it would be a no-brainer, but I mean, that's that's beyond my lifetime, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I think in the meantime, we, we should be making better use uh, of what is a, it's a very well-proven, robust technology. Uh, and it does, it doesn't just um, apply to, to, to the mass market. Uh, I tried to watch a, uh, a football match last night over IP uh, and suffered all the usual problems on it uh, of buffering. And as new people joined, more buffering, uh, unsatisfactory experience. So at the premium end, we may be there yet. But at the, at, at the long tail, we've got a long way to go yet. Uh, I, sh I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. We should basically... Um, let them uh, sit side by side for the benefit of, of all at the moment. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we're going to uh, turn to audience questions in a moment. So if you've got any questions, do um, type them in and they will come through to us and, and we'll be able to respond to those, um, hopefully. Um, but uh, it's sort of a corollary to the improving quality. How long can we justify sustaining the quality um, of, say, standard definition um, that uh, really seems to be, you know, at great odds to the sort of screens that uh, companies like LG are now providing into homes. And, you know, we hear from Maria that, um, you know, large numbers of homes now have, um, you know, very high quality uh, screens in their home. But, um, you know, broadcasters in many cases are, are still emitting standard definition that doesn't look so great on these, these big screens. How far as an industry do we continue to support that? And, and what is our strategy for encouraging to move people beyond that? Or, or do we have to continue to illuminate those services and, until we finally switch them off? Anybody care to comment on that? I think I, I would come in on that, William. And I think the best way to convert someone is, is to give them a 4K TV um, and try watching SD on that. It's, it's bloody awful, to be honest. Um, I think, um, again, with adaptive bit rate, SD sort of disappears a little bit. And um, I, I'm in favor of, of making HD the norm, but I accept some people still still watching SD. But I think 
I think you're right to argue. I mean, I've got a, a 4K HDR TV and I can't watch SD on it. It's just, it's just awful. Um, so I think as screens change, I think appetite will change as well. So um, that, that question has actually come through explicitly. Does anyone have an opinion why the UK DTT platform doesn't have a roadmap to move broadcast content to HD from the multitude of SD channels? Um, and perhaps I'd add to that question, why is it, for technical reasons, it appears that we still can't deliver the BBC regional news um, in, in anything other than SD, which basically means that for the reasons that Jamie described, that I no longer watch regional television news. Should we have a roadmap? And if so, who who is responsible for the roadmap? I mean, I can jump in again if you like. As, um, as a um, when I was working, uh, when I did the BBC Olympics, we actually did uh, build a new gallery to do the regional news in HD because of the disparity in quality of pictures between coming from the live event into the news bulletin. I think, to be frank, it comes down to cost, production costs. Um, and, and having to refit out your your workflows to support HD, um, and I think that's that's the bigger challenge on broadcasters. And you know, as I said earlier, we capture everything in 4K now minimum, and then we we down res it or down convert whatever term you want and distribute in either HD, ST as well. Um, so I think I think a, a large element of it comes to change workflows and costs. I mean, undoubtedly, there is a, there's a cost element, but without a strategy, um, you know, you're, you're never going to get there, are you? Um, and it, it seems that, that this situation has persisted for, for 10 or 15 years, um, and we're probably looking at another 10 years in terms of the DTT platform. Are, are we not sowing you know, the, the seeds of our own disaster in terms of continuing to provide services that are less and less attractive compared to those that can be delivered by online competitors? I, I fully agree, um, and um, I, I can only refer to the um, some of the blogs that yourself and um, Nigel Wally have written recently uh, on these subjects, which I completely agree with. Um, even my National League North football match last night to probably less than 100 viewers was done in HD. I really don't understand why a national broadcaster <laughs> can't do it the same. That's uh, that's uh, very very interesting. So uh, yeah, thank thank you for that, that that support. Certainly, it's a it's a theme that we've championed for uh, for some time on on Inform ITV. And I think as we see more and more uh, large screens, um, you know, now becoming dominant in in the home, um, it becomes increase, increasingly indefensible. Um, and it does seem um, extraordinary that, um, that there isn't some sort of a, a priority around this. Another aspect that I think is not so much discussed is in terms of commercials um, for commercial channels. Um, you know, the, this is a, a huge opportunity for them to provide a premium advertising experience that can't be delivered by any other medium in the home on, on large screens. Um, and yet still the delivery standards, they're only just getting to HD, certainly um, not in four providers should be able to provide a 30 second spot in, in 4K, if not better. So, um, you know, I, I do think sometimes it's a question of the industry not really uh, focusing on, on the, the technical um, priorities um, and getting a bit distracted by uh, some of the distribution opportunities, uh, let us say. So um, I will call for questions um, once again. Um, so if we do have any questions, um, hopefully those will um, come through to us. Um, if not, I will certainly uh, be more than happy to, uh, to ask questions on your behalf of, of the panel. Um, so what, what I would say is, what do we think gives the, the best sort of um, cost benefit in terms of if there was one upgrade that you could make to a mainstream channel? Uh, perhaps, Jamie, from, from your experience, um, what would it be? Would it be, uh, would it be frame rate? Would it be a dynamic range? Would it be spatial resolution? Um, is there any single factor or, or is indeed a combination of, of providing a wholly upgraded experience? I think um, it's interesting isn't it? because 4K for me was a differentiator, but a lot of people would argue it's not as big a jump from HD um, as people would expect to see. I think when we started um, broadcasting in uh, HDR and wide color gamut, that was a massive, a massive difference actually, and and it's about that um, contrast and that color aspect. But uh, as I alluded to earlier, I do think higher frame rates can go a long way to making even HD or 4K look even better. Um, so it's it's a mix and match for me, and we just keep building on it. 
to try and, and try and get that optimum viewing experience. I, I think we okay, well, thanks very much. I think right. we're coming out of time now. So um, is the current technical quality of broadcast television good enough? Well, maybe, maybe not. We haven't really decided today. But what can we as a sector, uh, what can we do about it? If we remain complacent, we may be opening the living room door to online competitors to continue to take more of our viewing time. Well, if that horse hasn't already bolted. Well, I'd like to thank our panel for their experience and expertise today. Uh, Maria Aguete, Jamie Heindhoff, Dr. Mariana Lopez, Stuart Stitch, and Patrick Burden. I'm William Cooper of Inform ITV. Thank you for joining us. I'm sure this is a conversation that will continue. Perhaps it's a conversation that we can continue with our televisions in the future. I think it's certainly a conversation that we should be having. Um, I hope it'll prompt people to think about the technologies and strategies, particularly for mainstream broadcasters. And I'm sure the DTG will be at the forefront of that debate. So now back to Andrea in the studio. William, thank you very much indeed. Now, yeah, coming up, we have a fascinating and possibly terrifying demonstration showing how hackers can get into and control the smart home. That's when we come back in just a few minutes' time. See you then.